Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. From the 25th verse of the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Having heard this sermon of Jesus, that's exactly what it is, a kind of parable, in the 16th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, many times in the past I've wondered what sense to make out of this statement that we just quoted in our text. In your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted and you're tormented. And I often wondered, does that mean that if I receive good things in this life, that I'm going to be tormented in the life hereafter? Do I have to be tormented here in order to receive life hereafter? That's kind of what it seemed like to a juvenile mind like mine at the time. <clears throat> I wondered about it and I thought, well, I don't think God could really mean that I can't receive anything good in this life because it'll lead to hell. I don't think that. And therefore there's there's more to it than that. I think this this man was not only receiving good things, but he was stingy. And he wouldn't share with somebody who was in a lot worse shape, someone who really needed his help. And that's what his problem was. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I don't think I would do that. I think if I saw somebody in trouble and I had the ability to help, I don't think I would be quite as stingy as this guy. And therefore, I had a tendency, which I think probably is not uncommon to Christians when they hear this parable to say, therefore, I kind of excuse myself. Jesus isn't condemning me. He's condemning other people that are more stingy than I feel like being most of the time. And I kind of skated by it, you see. Uh, people will go to church and hear this today and they'll come out saying, well, I guess I'm not quite as bad as that, that guy in the parable, therefore I'm good to go. And they have walked away from this without learning a single thing. They skated by the whole lesson by that kind of reason, you see? And it sounded logical, didn't it? And that's what I confess I did with this parable for many years. But you have to stop and think about it. Remember what Abraham said to the man, why he was condemned. He didn't say, you had the ability to help Lazarus and you didn't do it and he was in need. Therefore, you're being tormented now. He didn't say that. He said, you had your good things and he had evil things. Now, I don't think that Abraham, when he said that, or Jesus, when he put those words into Abraham's mouth in the parable, meant that you had good things in this life because everybody has good things in this life. Life itself is good. So much so that no matter how bad off life is, people still want to hang on to it. They don't want to die. They're testifying by that, that they think life is good. And so I don't think he meant just that this man received good things in his lifetime. Notice the word, thy good things, your good things. Now that puts a different meaning on it. That means that these were the things that the man had set his heart and soul upon. They were his, in his estimation, his chief joy. In fact, his only consolation. That's what this means. He had received in this life what he considered his only consolation his only reward. And this makes it very akin to, the, to another parable 
that Jesus told about the Pharisees. That when they prayed, they prayed so that they could be seen by others to be praying. So that they could be admired by them and have the reward of knowing that they were admired. And Jesus said, they have their reward. And I submit to you that when he said their reward, it's the same thing he meant when he said to this about this man, he had thou receivest thy good things, thy reward. You had the thing you set out to get and you didn't believe there was anything more to it than that. And you set your heart upon getting that and when you got it, there was nothing more to it. That's what it means. He didn't believe in any life hereafter, any reward for disciplining himself and giving up anything in this life. Any reward for faith and discipline and obedience and honor. No, none of that. He thought being rich carries with it a reward. And that reward is to enjoy the benefit of your wealth. I have it. I'm enjoying it. I've got what it was given to me for. That's all there is. I don't want to hear any more. That's what he had. He had a mind that was set on the good things that he could get by his advantages in this world. He cared nothing for anything beyond that. That's what it means. Thy good things, thy reward, thy consolation, thy chief joy. That's what it means. You have set this up as your single one desire and you got it. And that's what the Pharisees, when they prayed for they didn't pray because they wanted God to hear their prayer. They didn't care a hoot about God hearing their prayer. They wanted to be seen by the other poor folk as being especially holy for praying. And they got that advantage. The other folks saw them praying, thought, my, how holy they are. And Jesus said they got their reward. They got the thing and the one and only chief joy and consolation of their heart that they set out to pray to get. They weren't praying God to give them anything else. They're praying to be admired for praying. That's the reward. That's the end of it. And when they die, the whole thing dies with them. That's what it means. This man had nothing in view but enjoying his riches. He didn't believe there was any more to life than that. And he was lucky enough, the way he would say it or see it, to have, be the one, one of the few that had the riches to enjoy. Therefore, let's enjoy it. But that was the problem. Not that he didn't help out somebody else in need, but that he had no other value than enjoying his good things here and now. He didn't see any other rewards beyond that. Now, human nature resists rewards beyond the here and now. We like to call it, well, pie in the sky, people say. It's kind of putting a uh, negative meaning on the hope for blessings hereafter or in the life hereafter. And they ridicule people who put their trust in things like this. Why should we trouble ourselves over rewards in another world, which we can't even see, and we'll be dead before we get there. Why should we sacrifice anything for that? Why not have your good things now? As the saying is, you only, you're only young once, you only live once. It's sort of an invitation to have all the fun you can now, because this is the only chance. See, it's the same as this, old, this rich man's philosophy. Enjoy your good things now, because that's all there is. That's what the world's gospel is. And that's inherent in sayings like that. That's inherent in the resistance that every human being has to make sacrifices for something better, which is beyond the here and now. To listen to the voice inside that says, you may serve your own feelings by lying or by giving into a fit of anger or by condemning somebody else roundly and soundly and walking away feeling self-righteous. You may serve your own feelings by that, but is that God's judgment? They don't want to listen to that voice. They want to put it behind them. 
And that, that resistance is so strong that the prophets saw it in the Old Testament and they condemned the people of Israel for having that spirit. In Isaiah 30, verse 10, Isaiah describes the people of Israel at that time as being a rebellious people. And he says, they say to the seers, that is to the prophets who see things beyond this world, they say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Tell us friendly lies, in other words. That's what, that's what that means. We don't want the truth, you know. Don't tell us that. Tell us something that makes us feel better. What am I going to church here for? You're telling me things that disturb me when I come here. Tell me something smooth, right? Don't prophesy right things. Prophesy smooth deceits. That's, that's, what I, that's what I came here for. That's, that's all you need to do. If you do that, buddy, I'll put a lot of money in the offering plate. You'll have it good. I'll have it good. That's all. Go away with these righteous judgments that are troubling. Troubling. I don't want to hear it. It's in Scripture. They were doing that. And St. Paul says the same thing is still going on. In 2 Timothy 3 to 4, he predicts that the time will come. Even after all the good Christian preaching they'd heard, the time will come. Second Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They don't want to hear it. Just like the people in Isaiah 30. They will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Is that not exactly a repeat of what Isaiah condemned the people of his day for? Prophesy not unto us right things. Prophesy smooth things. Prophesy deceits. They'll turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. St. Paul said it would happen in New Testament times. The prophet said it was already happening in Old Testament times. There's what you have. There's the philosophy of the rich man. He didn't want to hear about rewards beyond the here and now. Because he had it so good here and now that nothing else mattered. That's the essence of a bribe, essentially. That's saying to a person who has a sense of honor and a sense of duty to, to uphold the trust that's been reposed to him in holding his public office to do right for the sake of those who entrusted this to him. And somebody holds a bribe out to him and says, you're getting your living the hard way. Here it is in your hand. Just come with me. Forget all this. And the person looks with big eyes at the money and takes it and walks away from his trust. That's the essence of a bribe. And people in the, in the spirit who let the world lure them away from what they know to be true and right because the world pays off here and now. The benefit of telling a lie pays off here and now. The benefit of cheating or the benefit of putting somebody down instead of trying to make up with them and get along with them. All that, you see, is tough. You just walk away from that and curse them. And it's easy. And your life is simple, simplified. Your problems are shut down because you turned your back on them. That's the temptation. And when people get into that, then they start gathering all the good things to themselves. And like they're like that man in the parable that, Saint, that Jesus told in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. And the man said, um, I have too many goods to put in my barn. I will tear down my barns and build bigger barns and put my goods in those places. He had so many good things in this life, he didn't know what to do with them all. And Jesus says this in the parable, Luke 12, 19 to 21. And I will say, I will say to my soul, he's quoting the, the foolish man. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, 
eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? And Jesus adds this admonition at the end in verse 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, that is in this life, and is not rich toward God. My, there's a lot of freight in that last clause and is not rich toward God. We'll have to look at that some more to see what that means. But that's what he said. He cares, and he said also in Matthew 13, verse 22, that the cares and riches of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. He said, he was speaking of the seed that was sowed, different kinds of ground in Matthew 13. And in verse 22, he said, He that received seed among the thorns is he that received the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Do you remember what we just said? The deceitfulness of riches. The bribe is inherently deceitful. It's telling you there is nothing else. There is no higher value. Honor is nothing. Duty is nothing. Trust is nothing. Present wealth and enjoyment thereof is all there is. That's the lie. And Jesus calls it the deceitfulness of riches. When you have riches, you're inclined to think, that's all I care about. That will get me everything I need. That's the deceitfulness of riches. And when you feel that way, it chokes the word. What is the word? The word of Jesus Christ. The word that was meant to take root in your heart and bring forth fruit to repentance and faith and a life devoted to him and to repentance and to allowing his spirit to govern you instead of the lusts and desires and joys of this life. Lay not up treasure on earth, but lay up treasure in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be. We need to stop and think for a minute. We don't have anything against the good things of this life, but they are not our chief joy. Even in Lamentations, we thank God for these mercies. Verse 3 Lamentations, verses 22 to 24, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness, thy faithfulness. That's a description of how the Lord is taking care of us even with regard to earthly comforts. It's of his mercy that he grants us those things. And then follows this prophetic word in verse 24 of Lamentations, which is exactly Jesus Christ's message. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. Do you see, even though we thank God for his present mercies in this difficult life, we turn around and stop and say, they came from God. Therefore, therefore, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, will I open him. I won't open him because he puts my next meal on the table and he takes care of me getting all the good things in this life. He is my hope. He is my portion. He is my caretaker forever. The Lord, not the gifts that the Lord gives me, temporal though they may be and merciful though they may be, he turns the prophet turns our attention immediately toward God. He is my portion. In other words, what is that word, my portion? That's the same thing as, as Jesus said that Abraham told this rich man, thou you know, receivest thy good things, that is, thy portion. That was your lot, your inheritance, your portion, so to speak. Like this, the prodigal son who said to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. 
That word is used to mean that's my inheritance, that's my reward, that's my consolation, that's my final and chief joy, that's my portion. And so the prophet in Lamentations is saying, the Lord is my portion, not his gifts, the Lord himself is my portion. And that brings us right back to Jesus saying, be rich toward God. What is it to have to be rich toward God and to have treasure in heaven. What does it mean? It means to recognize God as your reward. Well, you say, how's that? How can, how can God himself be my reward? Well, first of all, let's establish if that's what scripture says. And if it is, then we can try to understand how it can be. All right, let's take this in two steps. Does scripture say that God himself is your reward? Not the good things that you can put on your table to, t to tickle your taste buds every day. To live fair sumptuously while the beggar is outside dying. Not those good things. But God, is he your reward? Is the Lord my portion? As the prophet said in Lamentations. Is he your chief joy? Your chief joy? Above all others that you would sacrifice all others for? That's what it means. Listen to, listen to Jesus Christ as he spoke to Abram in the very beginning before there was any law given, before there was any covenant, any Old Testament, any law, any Torah, any Ten Commandments. Hundreds of years before Moses came into existence, Abram believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. And Genesis 15, 1 says this. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now that should stop you right there. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Word and vision don't fit together, do they? Word is a sound. Vision is a sight. What do these two have belong in the, how do they come in the same sentence the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision and this vision that he could see spoke and said fear not Abram I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward this vision that spoke was the word of the Lord. That's what it says, all in the same verse. The word of the Lord came in a vision and said, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What is the word of God? His son, the word. God the Father spoke all things into existence. The son is the word by which all that came into being. God is God the Son is the Word. Jesus Christ appeared to Abraham. That's what it means when it says the Word of the Lord came in a vision. So Abraham saw Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus told the Pharisees in John 8th chapter. Abraham saw me. Saw my day. Here it is in Genesis 15.1. The Word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And said, I am thy shield. I am your exceeding great reward. All right, well, how does that pan out? He does say it. And the psalm, and Job says the same thing. He says, I have esteemed the words of God's mouth more than my necessary food, you see. He put God's words, Jesus Christ, above even the food that keeps body and soul together. That's Job 23.12. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And David, the prophet, says in Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight in the Lord, and he shall give thee thy heart's desire. If your desire, your delight is in him, then he'll give you your heart's desire, which is himself. That's if you, who you delight in, right? That's what it means. If you delight in him. He will give you himself. He is the reward. 
There it is all coming together. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life, John 6, 35. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. So many ways he is saying, I am your reward. How can this be? How can it be? But he says it in the sense of the sacrament. The sacrament meaning not that the sacrament is our reward, but that what it signifies is. The sacrament signifies his death. That's what it is. There are the symbols of death. The body slain and the blood shed. And that's what he wants to remember about him. What is it that makes him our reward? His brokenness. His brokenness for us. Symbolized in the sacrament. Carried out in fact on Calvary. It's the brokenness of Jesus Christ that makes him accessible. If his righteousness were all there were to it, then it would be like coming up to the city that was surrounded by a high wall of righteousness. Everything inside of that wall is righteous and pure and undefiled. And here I am, dirty and fallen and broken, lying on the ground on the outside of that wall. I have no access. I'm excluded. How do I get in there? I can't. Nothing unclean can go in there. But Jesus comes out to meet us in brokenness. In brokenness. No other way. Because we're broken. He suffers it first for us. And says, identify with me in my brokenness. And then I'll take you back into my kingdom. I can't preach this to you because I'm not broken as I should be. It's a lifetime of practicing that discipline to be truly broken spirited before God. That's the purpose of coming to church. That's the purpose of being a Christian, to find out how it is that, we are, that our will is sacrificed and broken and making us available to God making us available to the workings of his spirit by breaking down self-will. Self-will is that same kind of barrier we put around ourselves that the righteousness of God puts around himself. But he broke it down by allowing his son to be slain for us. Do you know, there was a story. Maybe true, maybe, maybe not. But it was more than 100 years ago over in Italy. There was a man who was a criminal. He was a fugitive from justice. He was wanted, and the police were hunting him down. If they caught him, he would probably suffer the death penalty. And he fled for his life. And his friends decided they had a scheme to protect him. And what they would do is they dress him up as a priest. And they did. And they got him assigned to a little obscure country church over in the foothills of the Alps. And he played the role of a parish priest in that little church in the middle of nowhere to a little congregation for years and years and years. And nobody ever realized who he really was. And so after a while, as eventually happens, the word got out who this guy really is. He's not really a priest, he's a fake. He's a criminal. He's a criminal. He's, wanted, he's a wanted man. He's, he's doomed. He's subject to the death penalty. That word started circulating among his people. And as soon as that happened, you know what happened? All the sinners and the brokenhearted ones and the outcasts and the ones that knew they were in the wrong and deserved to be punished all came flocking to his door to tell their story to him because they knew in him was another broken man like themselves and he couldn't keep them away they thronged him and he he finally said look I'm just not I'm not really who you think I am they didn't care he was there 
He was their pastor. And he was a wanted man and a criminal and broken just like they were. And they identified with him and put all their sins at his feet and all their errors and all their shortcomings and all their griefs and pains and gripes and all the things that made them outcast and spilled them all before him. Just as the sinners did in Jesus' day. It's that brokenness of the man that they sensed. They just saw that he was a sacrificed spirit. They knew it. That's why they flocked to him. That's why the sinners flocked to him. They said, if this man has some contact with the gate of heaven, I don't care what it is, and yet he's broken and condemned and rejected and criminalized, just like I am. I'm going to identify with him. You sort it out. But that's what happened in Jesus' name. All the righteous ones didn't even know who he was, had no use for him, and found out that when he was meant to be their sin offering, rejected the whole concept of it, including himself, and put him to death. But the broken ones saw the brokenhearted Jesus, they identified with him, and they put their brokenness into his hands, and they let him lead them forth. Wherever he would go, they would go, because they trusted him. He isn't just our reward because he said so, he's our reward because he gave his life. He sealed it with his blood. He's our reward because he allowed himself to be broken in will and in life and in body. For our sake, not for his own, just for love of you and me. That's what makes him our reward. That's what makes him better than anything you can think of in this life. To have a redeemer who allowed himself to be crucified and sacrificed and broken and condemned and his blood shed in death when he was innocent just because he loved you, the real fallen one. There's his claim. There's the validation of his statement that I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Those who are sinners and only those who know they are sinners and broken can see him as their redeemer and their chief joy. And when they do, when they do, they won't necessarily put aside all the mercies that he grants us in this life, but they will put them in jeopardy in order to stay with him. They will be ready to part with them if they need to in order to stay loyal to him. That's what he means by giving them up. You're sacrificing him all the good things in this life. If you put him first, you're jeopardizing your ability to continue enjoying the good things of this life. If you put him first, it means you may have to die for him. You may have to starve to death for him. You may have to be put out in the cold because you followed him. You may have to be all alone because you followed him. If that's, if that's the case, and if your trust is in him, and if that should be the cost, you know where your first loyalty is. You know he, the broken one on Calvary, is your chief joy and your redemption forever. And you will stick with him, come what may. And when we do this, then is released within us the spirit and all his gifts like Paul enumerates in Galatians 5. The gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance or self-control. Those are things that you and I don't have, but the Spirit will put in us if he dwells in us. If we have put God first and all the good things in this life after that, if he allows them to us. Then we can truly say, delight in the Lord, 
and he shall give thee thy heart's desire. And then we'll follow it up by the rest of what it says in Psalm 37. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Put thy trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall make thy righteousness as clear as the light, and he shall make thy just dealing as the noonday. Even in the Old Testament, farther back in Isaiah, thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusteth in thee. Therefore, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Lord Jesus Christ, let thy living spirit dwell in us. Show us how great was the sacrifice of thy life for our eternal life. Awaken us to thy brokenness for us. Christ crucified, yes, Christ crucified, and make this our chief joy at the cost of all other joys, if it be thy holy will. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.